All right. Last week we talked about uh, some addictions and how to overcome those addictions. And I said you were probably going to get kicked last week, and I know a lot of people did. So while you're still down on the ground, (laughs) we're going to talk this week about are you dedicated to God? We're going to talk about what level of dedication you have and how to become more dedicated to the Lord. We're going to start out in Luke chapter 9. Four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John coming after Luke. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. So we're going to start out. Okay, it says here, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, what is going on here in this passage is jesus against people having a home is he against you burying your father is he against funerals is he against you having uh relations with your family you know being kind to your family and saying goodbye to them is that what's going on here no jesus is trying to illustrate a point okay actually three points which we're going to look at today jesus is illustrating that there are three types of people that can't follow the Lord, and there are three reasons why. Okay, what's the first one that you see there? A man wanted to follow Jesus. He actually came to Jesus, and Jesus said to him, About foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. What's he trying to say to the guy? You're not going to have all the comforts that you want if you're going to follow me. You're yeah. not going to necessarily have, have your home and things like you want it. Mm -hmm. you're not going to have the comforts. In other words, Jesus could see in this guy, you're not going to be able to endure hardness. And there are a lot of people that cannot endure the hardness. They're too thin-skinned, they're too soft, and they can't take being in ministry for the Lord. If you're going to be in ministry, you're going to be attacked, you're going to have to endure a little bit of hardness. And if you can't, you're going to quit real quick. Real quick. Okay, so there's the first type. What about the second one? The second guy there, he he says, uh, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. What's going on there? Well, there are some things that he hasn't buried. Okay, we're, and we're going to look at each one of these in detail, so I don't want to get too far ahead of it, but the fact is the man wasn't dead to the world. And we're going to see about that as we continue here. What about the third one? What did he say? Let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. What was his problem? He loved his family more than Jesus. And you're going to see that. You can't put your family before the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to be dedicated to God, he comes first. Okay? And again, let me just say, the Lord's not against you having a home or against funerals or against you getting along with your family. But he's trying to illustrate here that there are three reasons why men are not dedicated to the Lord. And there are three reasons, too, by the way, why most people don't get saved. And strangely enough, it's for the same three reasons. But we'll see that as we continue. Okay, let's look at the very first one there. We're going to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. My two favorite verses in the entire Bible. And kind of my uh, verses I rely on the most being in ministry. The first man there, he couldn't endure hardness. Okay, he had to have comforts, and you can't have that always as a Christian. Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 
No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Okay? The first type of dedication that you need to have to the Lord is you need to think of yourself as a soldier. Because we are at war right now. And it's getting the war, the battle lines are getting more drawn every single day. Okay, it used to be that all the churches in America, you know, you go back 50, 60 years ago, the churches pretty much were fighting the same battles. You know, they were preaching salvation, using the King James Bible, singing the old hymns. You know, there were a lot more of us, or at least people that professed to be like us. Now, there aren't many. You know, the the troops of the Lord, the ones that are actually fighting the warfare, uh, we're, we're kind of whittled down to like some special forces outfits. <laughs> we don't have large battalions and things like that anymore. You know, we're down to just a couple, you know, fire, little small fire team, fire teams. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> Maybe even some sniper and spotter teams, you know, two going out by two, Amen. you know, we don't have that big of numbers anymore and we are at war. Okay. I mean, just get down through the list of some of the things that threaten the body of Christ today. You have radical sodomites that want to imprison us, that are getting street preachers arrested out there because they're preaching against their sin. You have Catholics taking over all of the churches. You have churches that years ago would have never stood with the Catholic Church, and now they go to ecumenical meetings. You have pulpit swapping going on here in America where Protestant quote-unquote churches are allowing Muslims, imam, Muslim imams, you know, their priests, to come in and speak and read from the Quran in professing Christian churches. The battle lines are definitely drawn. You have New Age philosophy coming into the churches. I mean, it's just incredible how many battle fronts there are right now. Okay? You need to be a soldier. You need to think of yourself as not, you know, oh, we're going to get along with people. You know, that's the danger. We are at war. And as soldiers, we can clearly see the enemy. The enemy is advancing. You have no other option but to fight. Unless you want to be overtaken and taken prisoner by the enemy. You know, and sadly a lot of Christians have done just that. They don't want to be on the battlefield. They don't want the discomforts of being in Christian ministry. They don't want the discomfort of being a King James Bible believer. And saying... No, the Catholic Church is wicked, it's evil. They don't want to do that. They don't want us to, to take a, a definite stand and say, this is wrong, this is sin, I won't have anything to do with it. See, they're like that guy that came and said, I want to follow you, Jesus. I'll follow you whether, whithersoever thou goest. I'll go wherever you want to go. And Jesus says, okay, come on over here. And the guy says, oh, wait a second, that's over in the King James only camp. You want me to be a King James Bible believer? Oh, oh, I don't know about that. And Jesus says, okay, okay, well, you know, you need to do that. But how about getting a website and um, having some people attack you? How about going out on the street and having people yell at you and scream at you as they're going by when you're trying to, trying to preach to them? How about going out door to door and having doors slammed in your face and having people threaten to call the police and having yourself get cussed out? Oh, well, uh... Is there some other kind of duty that I can do? No. That's the way it is. Well, I'll follow you, Lord, as long as it doesn't cost me anything. As long as it doesn't take me out of what I'm comfortable with. Nope. Sorry. Can't happen. That's the first kind of person that, that uh, will not follow. Now, there are three basic duties of a soldier. Okay, the first duty is to take orders and obey the commanding officer. You know, I mean, a commanding officer gives you an order. You don't say, you know, that just doesn't suit me. What other options do I have? You know, the commanding officer would say, well, you, you can either have my fist or my boot, you know. <laughs> you know, but that's what people do with the Lord Jesus. Jesus says, I want you to do this. Oh, well, I, I just don't feel called into that. Now, the Lord's not going to necessarily hit you with his fist or kick you with his boot, but the point is, you're not going to be blessed as much 
if you refuse to do what the Lord tells you to do. The second duty of a soldier is to be loyal and fight for your side. Okay? A lot of Christians, it's, it's, it's weird. These modern Christians, they actually make fun of militant Christianity. Well, I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight about it. Why not? Don't we have absolute truth? You know, as the people that are supposed to have absolute truth, shouldn't we be willing to fight for it? Oh, no, let's just give up ground to the enemy. Let's let them come in to the, to the camp here. Oh, they're breaking through the defenses. Oh, that's good. You know, modern Christianity is a, just a weird thing. The Bible said that there'd be a falling away, so it's, it's happening. doesn't mean you should be part of it. The third duty of a soldier is you need to be willing to risk your life and die on the battlefield if necessary. Now, that's a tough thing to come to. And, you know, you need to die to yourself spiritually. You need to die to what you want to do with your life. And we're going to be covering that in the next point. But it goes even beyond that sometimes. Are you willing to die for Jesus Christ? You know, if, if I'm telling you right now, Islam is spreading like a disease. And it is a disease. Islam is a wicked, satanic, false cult. You aren't going to hear me saying, oh, well, I think that that's another path to God. No, it isn't. It's a path to the God of this world, you know, to Satan. Islam's evil. Islam's wicked. But it's spreading. And, you know, right now they, you're still, you still have some protections and things under the Constitution. But if Islam or Catholicism takes over America, you're going to see Christians being executed. What are you going to do if that day comes? Oh, well, I'll just kind of blend in so I can, you know, be comfortable. Nope. You better stand your ground. Well, it might cost me my life. That's your duty as a soldier. Okay? Your duty as a soldier is not to question your orders. It's to charge the enemy. Okay? That's the way it's supposed to be. And you say, well, you know, is it easy to be a Christian soldier? No. It's actually a lot more difficult to be a Christian soldier than it is to be in the real military. Why? Well, let's look. Ephesians chapter 6. Turn over there to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. I'm going to show you why it's more difficult to be a Christian soldier than it is to be any kind of branch of the military. It says here in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand, stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. How would you like to go to a battlefield? I mean, let's say you get, they reinstitute the draft and you're drafted, you're put into the military, you know, or called back to the military. And they say, uh, we're going to be sending you to this battlefield and... There's no actual army there that's organized that you can see. They're all sniper teams. And there's thousands of them. Probably millions of them. And they're all hidden. They have developed a camouflage that is invisible. And you can't ever see them. But they're going to be firing at you all the time. Who wants to go? <laughs> Nobody in their right mind. But guess what, Christian? That's what you have to deal with. Okay, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Your enemies are not flesh and blood. It's spiritual wickedness. You can't even see it. And they're attacking you all the time. They're always throwing attacks at you. The Bible talks about the wiles of the devil. You know, we're going to see here in just a little bit about uh, the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Remember, it's not flesh and blood. It's not some guy standing down and, you know, far away from you shooting fiery darts at you. Uh-uh. It's talking about spiritual attacks. And the reason a lot of Christians don't get, they say, well, yeah, I'm not really being attacked. It's because they're so filled with darts and they're laying there dying, basically. They're spiritually dead, you know. But if you're trying to do something for the Lord, you're going to get attacked. If you're out on the battlefield, you will be attacked. 
And I can tell you right now, I've never heard of one soldier that enjoyed being shot at in battle. You know, I never met or heard or read any stories of a soldier that said, you know, that was really fun in that battle. I mean, I just had the time of my life, bullets whizzing over my head and hitting all around me in the dirt and everything and artillery going off. It was great. You know, that's a scary thing. And I'll tell you right now, do not be deceived. <laughs> you get into ministry, you will be shot at. And the worst part is, it's not always coming from the enemy. Sometimes you get what's called friendly fire. <laughs> okay? Sometimes you're charging the enemy and doing a great job of it, you know, and, and taking down some members of the, you know, the enemy and you're, you're running towards their lines and all of a sudden you hear rifle shots from behind you. And you start hear, hearing bullets cracking by you and you realize, turn, you look back, hey, my own troops are shooting at me. <laughs> and you're going to find that. Yeah, Dr. Ruckman, I, I've read a lot of his works and things, and he said something that an older man of God passed on to him, you know, when he was first getting into ministry. And he said, it seemed crazy at the time, but the longer he was saved, the more he was in ministry, he found it to be true. And that is, your worst enemies, a lot of times, are going to be Christians. Yep. There are a lot of well-meaning but very ignorant Christians out there that think that you're wrong and they're going to fire at you. That's not always fun. Okay? You're going to have to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. But you say, well, well, this invisible army, you know, this invisible army of devils and, and you know, God only knows what else. And what chance do we have against them? Well, in your flesh you have no chance. But the Lord has not left us without uh, power here. Look at verse 13. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. It doesn't say to conform by the way. It doesn't say to, say to change or to update. It says to stand. Okay. And you're going to see that throughout these next couple of verses. You're going to see the thing of standing. Verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Okay. Right there is your what you need to stand with. Okay, now that's not literal armor. Just as your enemies are not literal, your armor is not literal. Okay, you don't have to wear a helmet and a, and a carry around a shield and a you know. Well, I'll talk about the sword in a minute, mm -hmm. but you know <laughs> that is literal uh, as far as the sword of the spirit is concerned. But the point is, it's spiritual armor. Okay, and spiritual weapons. And it's all defined there. Truth, righteousness, gospel of peace, faith, salvation. Okay, those are the things that you need to have. Those are the things that will help you to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. But I want, to, I want you to notice three things about the armor. Is there any protection given for your back? No. Breastplate. That doesn't say an armor plate, you know, for your chest and your back. It's a breastplate. And if you want to see the picture of what Paul is writing about here, he's writing about a Roman soldier. And look at a picture of them sometime. They have the breastplate there, and on their back, it's the leather straps that hold that breastplate on. Okay, and that breastplate could stop sword blows. It could stop maybe some arrows, you know. But if they turn and run away from the enemy, they're easy targets. Just one arrow right into the back or one sword stroke right into the back. Enemies, you know, soldiers dead. So you're not supposed to retreat as a Christian. The protection, your armor, is only on the front, which means you're to be advancing towards the enemy. Don't run away from them. Okay, number two, another thing you need to notice about the armor and weapons is that no lost person wants anything to do with any piece of the armor. <laughs> 
An armed Christian will never look cool to the lost world. Think about that. I'm going to be talking about that a little bit later too, in a little bit more detail here, but you know, Christians are trying to look hip. You can't make armor look hip. It's ugly, it's bulky, it's heavy. Even your modern day armor, your body armor, you know, ballistic vests and things, it's big, it's heavy, it's ugly. It doesn't look cool, it doesn't look hip. You know, you wouldn't want to, hey, I'm going to a party or something, I'm going to go out, you know, I want to look cool and wear my, you know, black, black jacket, yeah. Kevlar helmet. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. It's not attractive. No. And, you know, why? Well, because it's meant to be big to protect you. You know? You can't pretty up Christianity. A true Christian soldier is going to be repulsive to the world. And again, we'll see that in just a little bit. Number three, the third thing you need to notice there in Ephesians chapter six, notice that there is only one sword that you're supposed to be given there in verse 17 and the sword of the spirit. Okay. The before a singular word. The is a definitive article, sword, singular word. It can only be referring to one. And then it happens again, which is the word of God. How would it look if a soldier went out into battle carrying five swords on him? What good would you be with five swords? I mean, I, you know, it'll take me a couple hours usually to put a sermon together, and I'm using one book. If I had to look up the references in five or six different Bibles, I mean, that, that's not even sane. I mean, it's it's just, why would you do a thing like that? Why would you have five or six different contradicting Bibles to prepare a sermon? You know, yeah, they're not Bibles or versions, but perversions, the new ones. But the whole point is, what does a soldier do when he goes out into battle? He takes his best sword, his sharpest sword, his strongest sword. And you'll even hear among these, these new version type Christians, they'll say, you know, well, for a serious study, I like my New American Standard. And sometimes just for devotional, I like my, you know, the Message Bible or something. Why would you want more than one sword? It's confusion. But you see, they aren't aware of the battle that they're in. They aren't aware that they are on a battlefield, that there are spiritual powers all the time attacking them. Hey, I want a sword that's been battle-proven, battle-tested. For 400 years, this King James Bible has been proven on the field of battle. And it wins. It's won tremendous battles. That's the one I want. Oh, well, you know, well, we came out with this new one. You know, it's made with a new, you know, uh, space age polymer. You know, no, thank you. No. You know, the Bible says in uh, Hebrews about the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword. And it's interesting because there are a lot of countries where this King James Bible is banned, but they don't ban actual swords, metal swords. Hmm. You figure this Bible here might be a little bit more dangerous than physical weapons to the lost world? Yeah, you better believe it. This is a dangerous book. That's why the Catholic Church is trying to replace it while they're trying to get rid of it. They're trying to disarm you. Okay? Because they're sick and tired of getting hacked to pieces by these Bible-believing, King James Bible-believing Christians. So they want to give you swords from their armory <laughs> that are meant to break in battle. All right, I could keep going off on that all day. <laughs> uh, now, question. Will a real Christian soldier ever be attacked? Luke chapter 6. Turn back to Luke. Luke chapter 6, verse 20. Okay, it says here, and this is Jesus Christ speaking. You know, people say, oh, I want to be like Jesus and I want to follow Jesus and everything. Okay, well, let's hear what he has to say. Luke chapter 6, verse 20. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Huh. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. 
Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Huh. You know, one of the most simple things that you need to get figured out as a Christian is, Jesus Christ was hated. He was despised. You know, we just read this past week in our um, weekly Bible study, our Thursday night Bible study, about how Jesus went back to his own town that he was raised in, and he went into the synagogue, and he got those people so mad that they grabbed him and took him out to the top of a hill, and they were going to cast him off a cliff and kill him. That's the sweet, loving Jesus. And he was sweet and loving too, by the way, and he was meek many times. But that was just one aspect of Jesus. There were times when the Lord Jesus was abrasive with people, when he told the truth. And it wasn't because he was just trying to be a jerk and tick them off. He told them the truth, and they didn't want the truth. Now, Jesus... And, and, of course, you know the story if you're a Christian. You know how he was eventually tried for, you know, brought up criminal charges that weren't even true, and they executed him. He died on the cross. And, of course, it's part of God's plan to pay for our sins. I understand that. But if that's what happened to God manifest in the flesh, to Jesus Christ, and we are his followers, what makes you think, if he couldn't get along with the world, if he couldn't get along with the people where he was raised, what makes you think that we will? Can we do better than God manifest in the flesh? Than the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, well, you know, Jesus didn't quite have it figured out, but I sure do. You know, Yeah. Wrong. Nope. You're not going to get along with this lost world. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. Another place he said about if they hate me, they're going to hate you. Just the way it is. And you say, well, I don't know if I can handle that. Okay, then you're, you qualify for the first type of Christian that doesn't want to be dedicated to God. Okay, you're going to be attacked. You're going to be have people say bad things about you. You're going to have to be a little bit thicker skinned than most people are in America today. Okay, and you say, well, I don't think I can do that. Okay, then you're not dedicated to the Lord. It's just as simple as that. If you can't take a little bit of suffering for the Lord, He's not going to be able to use you very much. Okay, now let's look at the second man. Turn to Romans chapter 6. What was the second man? He said, I need to bury my father. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. That's where we're going to go. Now, what's another word for your father here on earth? Kind of a, another term that people will use sometimes. They'll say, my old man. My old man, yep. Yeah. yeah, they'll say, my old man. Keep that in mind. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Look at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin for he that is dead is freed from sin now now if we be dead with christ we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that christ being raised from the dead dieth no more death hath no more dominion over him for in that he died he died unto sin once but in that he liveth he liveth unto god Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. What happens when you come to God as a sinner, when you repent 
to God. The Bible talks about repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The first step in your salvation is you come to God as a sinner. And if you don't come to God as a sinner and you pray a prayer, you didn't make it. Okay, you didn't get saved. There's a great departure here in this falling away from the word repentance. They pretend that it's not part of salvation, and the Bible is very clear. God commands all men everywhere to repent. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You have to realize that before a holy and righteous God, you are a sinner and that you deserve to go to hell. You don't come to God in your pride and in your arrogance and say, I'm going to heaven, you deserve, you, you know, you have to save me because I'm going to pray the prayer, you know, I'm not going to give up my sins, but you're going to save me. Uh-uh. doesn't work that way. Okay, you come to God as a sinner, and you say, I am sorry for my sins. I need help to get out of this sinful life. And then when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then God can come in, the Holy Ghost can come into your life, you were dead in trespasses and sins, then you are quickened, and now you have the ability to get rid of those sins. Okay, to fight those sins which you used to live in. And the old man dies. And the old man dies, exactly. You bury the old man. That's what baptism is about. That's why you do full immersion, because it's showing your death, your burial, and your resurrection as the new man. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Okay? It's right there. It's very important to understand that. But, you know, there's a lot of people that just aren't willing to bury certain parts of the old man. There's just certain things that they like to do there in that old, that old sinful way that they had there, you know, and it's just like, uh, I just can't get rid of that. I just... I really enjoy this, and I just, uh, I don't want to give this up. The Lord can't use you. You cannot be dedicated to the Lord and hold on to things from the old life. It doesn't work. Your sanctification as a Christian is dependent on you giving up things. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12 that you're to present yourself, as, your body as a living sacrifice. You know, you're to be a sacrifice. Jesus died on the cross, and your old man has to die too. And your old man has to be buried. So the guy comes along and he says, Jesus says to him, follow me. Well, I, I still have to bury the old man. And Jesus says, get it done. Bury that old man. Let the dead bury the dead. Get it done. Get rid of those sins. They're not good for you anyhow. There's no such thing as a sin that's positive. There's no such thing that a sin that's good for you and the Lord takes it from you and then you have to live without it. All sin is destructive. Every single sin. Okay? Get rid of it so that you can follow the Lord. A lot of people don't want to. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. And I'd like to do a sermon on this sometime, the, you know, the ifs for a Christian, you know, Bible ifs, because you'll see that if is a, is a condition. It's a kind of a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a conditional type of a thing. It doesn't say when ye then be risen with Christ. It says if, if, because there's a lot of false professors out there. Okay, look at verse 1 here. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Here we go again. Look at verse 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. It doesn't say, by the way, there, if you endure to the end. <laughs> you know, If you're saved, you will appear with him in glory. Okay, now your rewards, that's another thing. But you will appear with him in glory. Uh, verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, 
fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Okay? Be careful about that. Be careful that you don't start partaking of the sins of the lost world and end up having God's punishment come on you. Now, it's not going to be, God's wrath is not going to come upon you because we're not appointed to God's wrath. Okay? When you become his child, you won't ever face his wrath. But, he can still punish you. All right? It's kind of like if you have a child and he steals something in your home, well, he's going to get a spanking for it. Now, if some guy comes off the street and steals that, he might get a bullet for it, <laughs> you know, if he's threatening your family. See, it's a different relationship. The stranger that's coming in, the thief, he's not related. So you're going to have a different punishment for him than you would for your own child. See, it's a different thing, but you're still going to get punished. Be careful that you don't, you know, look at verse 5 there and kind of go over that list and say, am I guilty of any of those things? If so, you've got to get it cleaned up. Uh, Luke chapter 16, we'll go there next. Luke chapter 16 and verse 13 is where we're going to go. And I'm going to tell you something. Another thing about being dedicated to God is a dedicated Christian cannot be career driven. Huh? I can't be, you know, career driven. I can't be driven by my career and be obsessed with it. No. Not if you want to be dedicated to the Lord. Look at verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is the Bible word there for money, or the love of money. And it says, it doesn't say you can't serve God and make money, or make mammon. It doesn't say that. It says you cannot serve God and mammon. Serve is the key word there. There are people that serve mammon. They'd rather not serve God. They'd rather not be dedicated to the Lord. They want to be dedicated to their career and make a lot of money. And it takes dedication, by the way. Don't ever think that you can get rich quick. If you want to make it to the top of the corporate ladder, it's going to take a lot of dedication, a lot of hours put in. But guess what? If you're doing that, you're not going to be much use to the Lord. Now, does that mean that all Christians have to be poor? No. There are some Christians out there that are big businessmen and they do great things for the Lord. They give of their money and things like that. Great. Fine. Whatever else. But a lot of those guys, I remember the uh, the guy that came up with Watt and Shan or whatever back years ago. And he said that, you know, I mean, he gave money to Christian type churches and organizations and things. Just tons of money given, them, given to them. And I, I forget the exact quotes, but it was something to the effect that they said, you know, if the Lord told you that you had to give up your, your business, would you do it? And he's like, I'd do it in a, in a second. No problem. You know, he was using the money that he was making for the Lord, for the Lord's work. There's nothing wrong there. He was not serving mammon. He was serving God. And God chose to give him money because God knew what he would do with it. Okay. If God gave you a lot of money, would you serve the Lord with it? I certainly hope so. You know, the, the game show thing, you know, who wants to be a millionaire? Well, if you were a millionaire, if all of a sudden you were given a million dollars, how much of that would go to the Lord? Hmm. That's a tough question for me to answer. You know, I thought, well, you know, maybe I could get a you know, a big house and well, maybe you know, I could use a new truck or something. <laughs> you know, those temptations are there. I'm not going to lie to you and say, you know, I'd be not even tempted. I would be. And I think most people would be too if they were honest. But let's continue here. Verse 14. And the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. Hmm. When you start talking like this, the people that are covetous, they'll make fun of you. They'll deride you. 
Verse 15, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Boy, you better get a hold of that one. The friend of the world is the enemy of God, the Bible says. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There's a lot of scriptures that God is not real impressed by the things that people are impressed with down here. God doesn't think very much of celebrities. And when they build these mansions and they have 23 bedrooms or 23 bathrooms and 50 bedrooms or something like that, God's not impressed. You know why? They're building mansions down here on this earth because they've forsaken the way of the Lord. If they were saved, they wouldn't be in Hollywood. You know? And a lot of those people end up in hell. Aren't many movie stars that get saved and get out of it. Occasionally you hear a one, but anyhow, it's another subject. But you see there, if you truly want to serve the Lord, you're not going to be career driven. You're not, you cannot serve God and mammon. It's just as simple as that. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to go there. Next, Matthew chapter 6, here's another important uh, scripture. Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 19. says here, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. You know, a lot of these really ultra-rich millionaires are scared to death all the time of being robbed. I heard the one time, I think it was Steven Spielberg, lives in a home that's surrounded by a huge wall with guard towers, and the only way in is through with a helicopter. That sounds like prison to me. And it is. Why? He's got that thing filled with riches, and he's scared to death that people are going to come and take it from him. Hmm. Verse 20, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, there's a good old statement, which I have written down here, um, something you need to think about. And it's, it goes like this. Heavenly treasures are laid up when earthly treasures are laid down. Yep. You can lay up a lot of treasures in heaven where the you don't have to worry about thieves getting in there. No thieves going to break into heaven. <laughs> you know? But they can only be laid up when you lay your treasures down on earth. Doesn't mean you have to be, you know, take a vow of poverty or anything like that. It just goes back to the thing again of you cannot serve God and mammon. Just the way it is. Okay, now we're going to look at the third and final man. The man who loved his family more than God. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. If you know your Bible, you know where I'm going. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Again, some words, more words from the sweet Jesus of the Bible. And I'm not being sarcastic. The Lord knows why I'm saying that. Okay, this is the kind of stuff a lot of Christians don't want to hear, modern Christians. But this is another aspect of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Uh, wh what was that thing we read earlier about a sword? The sword of the Spirit? Hmm. And what does the sword do? Let's read here, verse 35. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. The verse there in Hebrews about the sword of the Spirit, it says about it divides. Did you know that the King James Bible divides? Yep. And I've gotten a lot of emails and a lot of you know, correspondence with brethren all over the world, and it's the same thing. I don't get along with my father. I don't get along with my mother. I don't get along, you know, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. I hear it all the time. There are some families that, you know, a lot of them accept the truth, but I have never met one family that across the board, they all get along as Christians, you know. 
when certain when Christians start to really accept the truth, it's going to cause division. Why? Because that's the nature of the sword. A sword is divisive. You know? Just the way it is. But continuing here, verse 37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Well, why don't you get a life? Okay, I have. <laughs> Serving the Lord. If you want, if you look at life and you say, I want a career, I want to have all this stuff, and I want to get along with everybody, you're trying to find your life. But if you, if you come to the Lord, you get saved, and you say, I don't care, Lord. You do with me whatever you want. I'll be a soldier in your army. You use me. You tell me what battlefield to fight on. I'll obey the orders. I'll give up what you want me to give up. You use me. Well, you're losing your life, but God is actually saving your life at that point. You know, I mean, if you were going to go on a trip and there were two people that could go with you, the one knew how to get to your destination, knew the roads by heart, could see out ahead, knew where you were going. The other one had no map, had never been there before. Which one would you want to take with you? That's not very difficult to figure out. The Lord can see out ahead. The Bible says that you're to acknowledge Him in all thy ways, and He shall direct thy paths. He won't make your path straight like the new versions say. He'll direct your path. He's the one that you want to put your life in His hands and say, you lead me, you direct me, you know where I'm going, you know what dangers lie ahead, you can steer me around them or whatever, or steer me through them. Put your life in God's hands. When you try to get your own life and take control of your own life, that's when things go wrong. Okay? You say, well, Brian, uh, is your life where you planned it? No. This isn't what I planned. Nope. But I'm glad I'm here. It's not always easy. There are times I get on the battlefield and I'm getting shot up like crazy or bullets flying all around me. And I'm just like, you know what? I don't, I want off this stupid battlefield. <laughs> you know? And the Lord comes along and says, here's a little bit of encouragement. Helps me to take some ground back for the Lord, you know. Whatever helps some other soldiers in the battle. And I get back up and charge against the enemy again. The Lord will do that. He'll allow you. He won't suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able to bear. Okay? So, onward, upward, forward. <laughs> As a Christian. Uh, <clears throat> Luke 9.62, which we read earlier. Uh, I'll read it here again. It said, And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, it's interesting. Another point I want to make here as we continue how many older Christians continue going to a church even though it has gone apostate? Because, well, I went there back in, you know, when I was young and, and I remember, you know, being in Sunday school and I remember this and I remember that. And the old pastor dies and the new little punk comes in from the seminary and brings in the new versions and brings in the rock music and brings in the new, all the new doctrine and everything and just destroys the church, but the older person stays because, well, that's where I've always gone. See? No. Not supposed to be that way. If you're in a church out there and you're listening to this and it's going apostate, get out. Leave. If the pastor doesn't want to change, you know, if the pastor's open-minded and he'll listen to you and institute some changes, then you be the one that stays there and fights off the apostasy. But if that battlefield is lost, if it's very clear the pastor doesn't want anything to do with you, then you leave. Don't put your hand to the plow and look back and say, oh, I remember back there in the old days. It's fine to return to the old paths. That's not what I'm saying. You should go back to the old hymns, go back to the old King James Bible. I'm not saying we have to have everything new. But what I am saying is the situation right now in America is not the same as it was 40, 50 years ago. And I know a lot of the older people have a problem because it's like they remember the church that they were raised in. And a lot of these guys, you know, I think it's going to go back to that. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. 
And there's a lot of people that resist the house church movement simply because they remember the, the good old days, the glory days. We're not going back to that. It's just going to keep getting worse and worse in this country. We can't go back. If your hand is on the plow and you're working for the Lord, don't look back. Okay, if you see apostasy in a, in a modern church and you're in it, you're part of it, get out of there. Don't say, well, you know, it used to be good. Is it good today? No, then leave. And by the way, you say, well, you know, but I'm an older person. They should respect me. Let me tell you about the modern church. The modern church could care less what older people think. You are a joke to the, the average new young pastor that's under 40 years old. They mock the desires of the older people, of the elderly. My grandparents were in their 90s and official elders of the church that they were going to, the pastor never even spoke to them. They didn't care. They didn't care what the older people thought. You're part of the problem. You're in the way. You say, well, I don't know about this. Well, right here I have a printout. I'm going to be doing a sermon on this in the future. I have a printout of the new ultra-radical emergent church movement. Right here's some of the posters that they put out to promote their satanic filth. And there's nothing, very little, I should say, that's more evil than these people that are there. They are possessed with devils. I'm telling you what, it is vexing to even read this stuff. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some of this. I'm going to be doing a, a message on this, you know, a, a special study on this. And I'm going to be actually putting these into a PDF form so you can actually see them. But they have a poster. It's of a brick wall and it's falling down. And it says, deconstruction. What kind of freedom would it be if we couldn't make the Bible mean what we want it to mean? Mm, wow. That's the mentality of the modern church. Don't let them tell you, don't let them deceive you into thinking that they respect traditional hymns and the Bible, the King James Bible. They don't respect it. Okay? This is the, the people that are pushing the envelope. They're seeing what they can get away with. This is the forefront of the apostasy. Okay? Let me continue. Then there's a picture over here of a text of Scripture. And guess what text of Scripture it is? King James Bible. And right in front of it, there's a picture of Gumby and uh, the little horse. I don't remember what his name was. Pokey. Pokey. Yeah, there you go. And it says, underneath that picture, it has a wording in here, and it says, Texts. Wonderful, bendable, highly amusing toys. That's what they think of the King James Bible. That's what they think. Down here, we have a picture of an older lady with a hat, you know, and like the, the hairnet, like the women used to wear to church. She's dressed in her Sunday best. It says, empathy, a virtue too good to waste on elderly church members. That's what they think of you if you're an older church member. Don't waste your empathy on them. Don't feel bad for them. Don't listen to them. That's what they believe. Here's a picture of a guy, and he's standing there. You can just see his back and his arms and his legs, and he's got a Bible hid behind his back. This is what the uh, caption says. Sensitivity. The Bible intimidates people besides my tattoos and t-shirt are clear enough. Don't carry a Bible that's intimidating to the lost world. And you look at the average modern church. You don't believe me. You go check it out. Go park in the, in the average modern church, these big mega churches, and you look at the people going in. Almost none of them have Bibles. Why? It's offensive. The Bible offends lost people. What are they that are going into these modern churches? Why would you be offended by the Bible? Down here you have two of these little Roman Catholic, these little naked fat children with the wings. You know, cherubs are supposed to be. They're not cherubs. They're just little devils. You know, Catholic imagination. But it says here, stories. Talking about Bible stuff, you know, it says, Stories. Myths we entertain our minds with so we can avoid nasty modern categories like truth, reality, and divine revelation. We can avoid divine revelation and absolute truth. 
That's what they're saying. And then over here, the final one I'm going to talk about, you got this country hick looking guy in, you know, bib overalls and a jean jacket, and he's he's laying on a hay mound. You know, just the old country hillbilly, you know, hayseed, you know. And he's laying there reading his Bible. This is what the caption says. Wholeness. People read their this stuff and think it has answers that can help their stress better than yoga. Get serious. That's the attitude. And yoga is completely satanic. Just watching some good messages from a brother down in Tennessee. He was talking about kundalini yoga. Kundalini is a snake. And you open up different chakras, seven different chakras, ener energy centers in your body. And the snake goes up through your body until it totally possesses you. And opens up your third eye in the middle of your forehead. The Ajna Chakra. You know. And, it, oh, that's, that's wonderful. Let's get into that as a Christian. Are you insane? But that's what these modern Christians do. They actually practice Oriental occultism. Rick Warren, with his Daniel plan, has prominent New Age yoga instructors coming in to teach his people. Teach them how to be in good health and stuff. It's, I mean, it is getting bad. And if you are part of that movement, you say, well, I... You know, I, I just remember the way it used to be. It's not that way anymore, and it's not going to go back. You need to get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. <laughs> Come out from among them and be separate. And you say, well, yeah, but, you know, we don't go as far as the emergent church goes. You know, we're, we're, uh, we're not that bad. But I'll guarantee you they still hold those same philosophies. Mm -hmm. The modern churches, even though they might not be as radical as the emergent church, they still hold to the thing that the Bible is not an absolute standard and that you shouldn't listen to the elderly people and that you need to deconstruct the traditional church. They still hold to that philosophy. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Just a couple more places to turn to here and then we're done for today. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. You say, what should a dedicated Christian do if they are in an apostate church? What we're going to see here, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Now, I've been over this, this passage here before, and a lot of people try to say this has to do with marriage, which is true. You shouldn't marry a lost person. But that's not what the passage is about. It's about fellowshipping with unbelievers. Mm -hmm. You don't get married to unbelievers. Okay? You get married to an unbeliever. Singular. This is talking about coming together for worship. And who's it written to? The church at Corinth. Mm -hmm. The most carnal church in the entire New Testament. They were meeting together with unbelievers. They are messing around. You, you read in other parts about them eating things sacrificed to idols and, you know, idol worship and all this stuff. What were they doing? They were messing around with people in cults, satanic cults. Verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, stay ye in with, the, <clears throat> with these people and try to be a positive influence. Oh, man. oh, I guess I read that wrong. You need to follow along in your Bible to make sure I'm not lying to you. Okay, yeah. just a little Bible check there for you. Yeah. Verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You know, the, the best thing for a parent is to have an obedient child, because then that parent can bestow blessings upon that obedient child. When a child is disobedient, the parent can't bless the child. The parent can't reward the child. Okay, the parent has to punish the child. The best thing for you to do as a Christian is to be obedient to your heavenly father. Why? So he can bless you. So he doesn't have to punish 
you. Okay? And just as a child, you know, you see children, they, they do, you know, something wrong and they, there's really nowhere for them to hide, <laughs> you know. They don't have the mind to to really cover up their sins all that well. You know, a child is very obvious, you know, when they're disobedient. We're the same way with the Lord. There's no place that you can go and hide and get away with your sin and He doesn't see it. When you sin, when you mess up before the Lord, He sees it. And He knows about it and He'll punish you. You're not going to lose your salvation. You're not going to be condemned to hell. You know, put that stuff out of your mind. That's not true for a Christian in the church age. But He will punish you. He has to. If He's a loving Father, He has to punish His children. So, get out of the apostate church system. So, we're going to recap here. Look at a couple more scriptures and then we're done. So, the three types of dedication. The first one, the man or woman that does not want to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. They just they don't want to be uncomfortable. God can't use you. You can't be dedicated to the Lord. The second one, death to self. Death to the old man. God can't use you if you have not died to the old man. He just not going to be able to do anything with you. The third one, you need to forsake the popularity and respect of family and friends. You say, well, I don't think I can do that. Okay, God can't use you. You're not going to get along with everybody. you got to get that thing out of your mind. Just as simple as that. And the interesting thing is, which I referred to earlier, those are three reasons why the lost people reject Jesus Christ. Oh, you know, I don't know if I could live as a Christian. Boy, that that's kind of difficult. And I don't know if I could give up my drinking and my dirty movie watching and my cigarettes and my filthy mouth and whatever. And oh, what would my family think and my coworkers? And that's why lost men reject Jesus Christ a lot of times. And because they're self-righteous too, you know, they trust, oh, I'm good enough, Father, I think I'll make it. No, you won't, you know. So when a saved man or woman doesn't want to be dedicated to the Lord for those three reasons, are they acting like a saved Christian or a lost man or woman? They're acting like the lost world. If you're not willing to endure a little bit of hardness for Jesus Christ, if you're not willing to die to sin, if you're not willing to be at odds with your family and friends, you're acting like a lost person. And God can't use you. And right here, I've done many videos about this type of stuff, but you have the Berean Christian Stores catalog. This is what modern Christianity presents to the lost world. And you look through this thing, and it's just book after book after book of smiling, happy Christians. You know, we just get along, and oh, look at us, we're so hip. Don't we have neat styles and, and oh, wouldn't you want to just be just like us? You know what this is? It's fake. And it's interesting because it's the same techniques that the lost world uses to sell things. Go pick up a lost book, you know, catalog, a bookstore. It looks the same. Same format, same pictures, same smiling faces. That's not Christianity. That's fake. Totally fake. And what happens is people are fooled into thinking that this is Christianity, that whole smiling, happy world there. And they start to experience a little bit of the battlefield and they turn tail and run. They don't want anything to do with it. And I'm going to tell you right now, dearly beloved, if you want to be a Christian and you want to do things for the Lord, you're going to have to be on the battlefield. And the battlefield is an ugly place. Okay, you're going to experience Christians that are sick and unhealthy and there's no explanation for it. I have a brother in Australia right now, amazing man of God, serving the Lord, you know, and, and just prison ministry. Amazing. He's losing his eyesight. His kidneys are failing. Probably not going to be alive much longer. Why? He's not even that old. I don't understand that. I don't understand. I have other people that I know, Christians, good Christians, that are struggling, that are sick, that are dying. Why? I don't know. Christians that I know that would make great parents and they can't have children. Christians that I know that have money problems. Christians that I know that have 
all kinds of problems. What's going on? It's a battlefield. And as a soldier, you can't look at that stuff. You can't stop and say, why? 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 I don't understand. I don't think I want to charge the enemy for a little while until I get this figured out. No. Your duty as a Christian soldier is not to question your orders, but to carry them out. You don't question the commanding officer, the captain of our salvation, as the Bible calls him, the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives you an order and you carry it out. Charge the enemy. Okay? That's the way it's going to be. Mark chapter 8. Two more places to turn to and then we're going to wrap it up here. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. says here, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Are you ashamed of Jesus? Oh, no, he's a wonderful guy. He's a great teacher. He's a great guru. That's not the Jesus I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus that's found in the Scriptures. He was a wonderful guy. He did want to bring unity, but it was unity around truth, absolute truth. This junk right here, this satanic filth right here, this emergent church movement, they are ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right there, the guy holding the Bible behind his back, he's ashamed of the words of the Lord Jesus. Oh, but they're fine Christians. No, they're not. They're ashamed of Jesus. They don't even know Jesus. I can tell you that. Don't be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the King James Bible. God wrote a book to the English-speaking world, and it's right there. Okay? This is the only one that doesn't trace back to the Catholic Church. All right? Oh, what about Erasmus? Erasmus was a Catholic. Okay. The text that he wrote, first of all, it wasn't the one used by the King James Bible translators. Secondly, did the Catholic Church ever use the text of Erasmus? No. They rejected it. They burned it. And they killed those who made translations of it. So don't fall for that lie. I just wanted to throw that in there. First Timothy chapter 1. Last place we're going to turn to. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. First Timothy chapter 1. Here, Paul writing to the young preacher, Timothy. Timothy's starting to get kicked around a little bit and he's starting to get discouraged which will happen okay wait a second here I was say. nope I got that wrong 2nd Timothy 2nd Timothy chapter 1 sorry about that yeah 2nd Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 I was really hoping to be infallible but I guess I'm not now I made a mistake uh so if you make mistakes, you're in good company. First, er, Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Partaker of the afflictions. Hmm. You know, it's interesting. It says over there in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Okay? Be a partaker of the afflictions. Get yourself some afflictions. Get yourself some suffering down here because it'll turn to glory when you get to be with the Lord. Continuing here, verse 9, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, 
whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also enjoy these things. You reading your Bible? I think it says suffer there. Yeah, the word suffer. I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul was laying up treasures in heaven, not down here on this earth. Paul forsook a lot of things. Paul was suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And he wasn't saying, well, that's for me and I'm going to get all the rewards and I'd, I'm not going to tell you about it, Timothy. He was encouraging Timothy. He was saying, hey, you see what's happening to me? You need to be doing the same things. God will take you through it. God will carry you through these rough times. I had a real rough time earlier this week to the point where I was starting to have thoughts of, you know, I'd like to quit this ministry. <laughs> You know, and the Lord brought me right back. End of the week here, you know, met with a, a Christian couple last night. You know, had a real good meeting, good fellowship in the Lord. And it was an encouragement. And the Lord will do that. You'll be on the battlefield. Things will be going really, really bad for you. And the Lord will say, okay, you know, I'll give you a little bit of encouragement. Get back into the fight, soldier. Yes, sir. Back to battle. That's the way it is. Verse 13. Hold fast. Remember what we read in Ephesians 6 about stand? Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. What I said there earlier, people will turn against you. Yep. Verse 16, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. You will have rough times as a Christian if you want to be dedicated to the Lord. But the Lord will send you encouragement. Here you have Paul talking about how he was in jail. And a lot of people were ashamed of him because of that. But there were still some brothers that weren't ashamed of his chain that he writes about. And they came and they helped him. The Lord will not ever, you will not ever get to a point where you're serving the Lord and you're giving up things for the Lord and, and the Lord just says, oh well... <laughs> Sorry, I can't help you. You know, you're just going to have to fend for yourself there, buddy. That's not going to happen. The Lord will never forsake you. Okay? He will do amazing things through you, but only if you're dedicated to Him. And that's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do. It's contrary to the flesh. The flesh doesn't want to endure hardness. The flesh doesn't want to die. Okay? The flesh does not want to not get along with people. But those are the steps that you have to take if you want to be used of the Lord. So, you say, well, Ryan, I I haven't been doing these things. I, I'm not real dedicated to the Lord. I, I guess I'm a failure. I guess I can never be used of the Lord. I guess I should just quit and just forget it. Uh, -uh. The beautiful thing about your relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're saved, is no matter what you've done in your past, an hour ago, even, five minutes ago, you can confess it, forsake it, and move forward. Get right back into the battle. It doesn't matter what you've messed up with in the past. Get up and charge the enemy. Confess it, forsake it, move forward. Okay? Don't dwell on the sins of your past. You put your hand to the plow, don't look back. Okay? Move forward. Get back in the battle. So that's going to be it for this morning. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. 
You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.